Our, our next guest uh, anchor is a brand new uh, television program entitled Olbermann, which airs uh, weeknights at, on ESPN2. And in the time, what a, by the way, what a fabulous uh, talent, journalistic television talent Keith Olbermann is. Yes. And in the time that we've known him and he's been on this program, he's had 19 different shows. <laughs> 19 <laughs> different shows, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, and every one of them wonderful in its own way. Yeah. And then something happens and he has to sit down. <laughs> But we're so happy he has another show. We're so happy he's here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Olbermann. Keith, come on out. The big head is back. Nice to yeah. see you. You have, and it's been, uh, I think it's registered somewhere, you have the largest head in television. <laughs> <laughs> Down to the Bureau of Weights and Measures. <laughs> Literally so. Yeah. Uh, you, you know I, Bruce, uh, Bruce Bochy, the manager of the San Francisco Giants, he's got a size eight and a half head. Good Lord. And I have an eight, and we tried to take a picture together, and we mm -hmm. couldn't fit. Could, would not fit. <laughs> Sorry, Special sorry, effects obvious. were required. Yeah. Uh, now, listen, I want to tell you something. I saw uh, an excerpt from your second show on ESPN to 11 o'clock every night, and you were discussing uh, concussion injuries oh, yeah. and the recent uh, monetary settlement in the NFL. I found this thing dense with information, uh, insightful and uh, nuanced, uh, and uh, I had not known uh, going into this uh, the severity of this problem yeah, in, in football general. Well, thank you for those for the kind words. It was and, wonderful. And it was, uh, somebody wrote a column. I won't say which sports website it was, but it's affiliated with this network. And uh, it, was, it was about how this was just a money grab by these retired players. And, and, and rather than just go, this is insane. I've met some of these guys, the guys who committed suicide because their brains were literally melting because they had too many concussions when they were players. Uh, the, it wasn't a money grab. These guys no longer could remember the question you had just asked them in the interview. And instead of assaulting this writer, what I did was I just took quotes from him, mm -hmm. and then we played clips of some of these guys like Jim McMahon, the great That's quarterback right. of the Bears, I, I mean, who guys, can't remember where yes, he and, is and, and most of the time. The, the list is much longer than yep. I would have guessed. Yep. And, and big names that you do remember, as, as well as, I, I won't say journeymen, but yep. guys that maybe weren't stars, but also had suffered this. And, and now, uh, what does this suggest for the future of football? This And, and then, you know, we had Herm Edwards on the other night, and he said, get over it. It's, it's controlled violence. That's what Americans want. Well, yeah, and clearly. But I think what one, one thing that might be reassuring from the point of view of how good is the football going to be in the years to come. The players have been working on this for 30 years. I covered the 1982 player strike when I was a reporter for CNN, show number one of the 19. And <laughs> I, I was, I covered this thing from like February till November. And one of the things they asked and couldn't get the, the, uh, the uh, owners to give them were their medical re records so they could find out what was wrong. And the, the rallying cry was about this running back from the Giants named Doug Kotar who had retired the first days of uh, training camp that summer. And he'd retired because he had a bad knee and a shoulder and they didn't come around. And what he discovered about three weeks later, after he had these blinding headaches, was he had a brain tumor. And the NFL said he's, he retired because of the knee, not because of any, any, any tumor or illness. And, and even if he had a tumor, why would you think that would have anything to do with football? I mean, it was a running back who went head first into the line. He was about 5'11 and a, kind of a bowling ball. And the players rallied around the idea of something about concussion research in 1982. So players have continually been working on this for 30 years. And last week I had, uh, not to name drop, but I had Peyton Manning on the show, your friend. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, I asked him, I mean, have you ever deliberately not thrown a pass into a particular spot on the field so you, you can avoid the prospect of your guy and the rival defensive back getting really creamed out there. Yes. What responsibility yeah. do you have as a quarterback if you have called yeah. that play? I said, how often, how often would you think about, about something like that? He said, only every play. Every play. He said, you can't always avoid it. It is a contact game, but you think about it first. Sure. He said, I never throw in the middle. Uh, certainly never throw a high pass to the middle because a guy who goes up in a short distance is going to have, there's going to be time for two defenders to knock him down. There's an excellent chance he spears into the ground and hits his head or his neck. Wow. He said, I, 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 he, I said, do other quarterbacks think about this? He said, all the time. So my point being, the things that you're, you're, the things that the football aficionado might be worried about, I think they have been slowly coming into the game for the last 30 years. And if they accelerate, what they're going to mean literally is, the guy who gets his bell rung is not coming back that game 
protect him. I think we can all. Well, you, that. I mean, that's the phrase we always heard invoked uh, right. previously. And we just thought, oh, a guy got hit in the head. Meaningless injury. That's what we all thought. Yeah. So stay out a couple of plays and go back in. But now on the other side, and the, the point that this guy uh, sarcastically was making was, oh, grow up. It's a violent sport. And these you guys knew what know what you were getting into. Yeah. Well, th there's a, certainly a great measure of truth in that. It is a violent game. And people do understand that w when, when they sign up to be uh, football players. Generally. Yeah, I think so. Where, where, how do we get this thing going? At the point where your brain injuries are so severe and you have been, whether through negligence or simply lack of knowledge in the 70s and 80s, rushed back into action, where you've, it's so bad that 20 years later, literally, your brain is beginning to, to dissolve. And in many cases, it's one player, a player from, the, from the Bears and the Giants, Dave, du uh, Dave Dewerson, killed himself, but first instructed his family to donate his brain to the study of the traumas resulting from concussions in the NFL. They're doing that in, at, uh, at BU, I think it is, or BC in Boston. And I mean, that's how bad it was. He knew he, he couldn't live with the pain and the disorientation and the memory loss and what it did to his life. But he, he had the presence of mind to say, you know, let Take me be look. part of the yeah, study. The when it's that bad, I don't think anybody signed up for that. Are, are, are any uh, player positions more vulnerable? Uh, is it random? Is it equally distributed offense, defense? Uh, it, it seems to be uh, that way, certainly because of the difference in how long a defensive player lasts in the NFL as opposed to an offensive star. In other words, a quarterback is probably more vulnerable simply because he plays more often, and he may not be hit as many times as a wide receiver or some sort of defensive lineman, but he's in the league longer. And so the, the cumulative effect, which is what the concussion thing is, I mean, one concussion, I had one concussion, and nothing bad has ever happened to me, but I mean, you know, that, relatively speaking anyway, but, <laughs> you know, uh, the, 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 the idea that you had 10, 12, 15, whatever the number is, that's where the danger lies. And, and, and what can be done about it? Uh, oh, a friend of mine says that the problem is that they're tackling differently, that we have to re-instruct people how to tackle. Is it as simple as that? The fact that they are bigger and faster also, uh, these are components. Yeah, but, every, but as, as with the answer to any question, certainly every, any question of safety, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. All of the above. Sure. With some difference in tackling, some difference in strategy, some difference in where the quarterback is, some difference in the rules, some minor adjustments in the equipment, and a little awareness. And the one thing that the players today are much more uh, uh, successful at is that, that spreading of awareness. And there, there are fewer... There used to be deliberate injuries that, that resulted from these kind of, uh, you know, deliberate uh, attempts to make these injuries. You don't have that anymore with the NFL. That's why the NFL went down so hard on the New Orleans Saints. You know, uh, a few years ago, I played uh, pitch and catch toss with Peyton Manning. This is yeah. long, about six years ago. And he said, uh, and this was just per nothing, he said that I had the best hands he'd ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> True story. Per, per nothing. But per nothing. Per best way. Well... But right, right there, right there is the is one of the early warning, warning signs, signs of, of concussion of syndrome. We'll be right back with Go, see your doctor. <laughs> Join Join us again tomorrow as Dave welcomes Alec Baldwin and Tony Kellett. We'll be right back with the amazing true story of a dog that traveled over 200 miles to get a document notarized. Let me, uh, let's talk about uh, Johnny Football. T tell me everything we should know about uh, Johnny Manziel, who was here on the show after yeah. he won the Heisman uh, Trophy. Did he seem happy about it to you? Uh, I don't recall. I just remember thinking, here's a, a great-looking young kid, yeah. and good luck for him. That was all I could think of. He did a nice job for us, and yeah. so there you go. Uh, he, he won the Heisman as a freshman, mm. an unprecedented yeah. thing to have happen, and he is... Uh, the, the star of, of uh, Texas A&M, and they built the program around him, and they've got a new stadium, and the coach got a million-dollar raise after he got the Heisman, and he got a good, warm handshake as payment for this. And so, I, apparently, he came very close to breaking NCAA rules about signing autographs for money, which would have netted him, him you know, a solid 10, 
ten dollars. I don't know, uh, ten uh, ten thousand uh, dollars for uh, his here, season. Here's the question I didn't understand. Yeah. So uh, Johnny Football uh, is signing autographs, or maybe he didn't sign. I I don't know whether he signed or not. He signed somebody else's name. So right. so the uh, NCAA is now outraged. Okay, are they outraged one because uh, uh, they're trying to protect the uh, the status of an amateur athlete? Yeah. Or are they outraged because Johnny Manziel <laughs> is commercial property of the NCAA and shouldn't shouldn't have clearance to do this without their approval? Yeah, the latter. Uh, it, it's it, what I don't. Here's what I don't understand. I mean, the NCAA is hot and cold running hypocrisy, and it always has been. But what I don't understand is why. What college football fan would suddenly go, "My God, they're professionals!" If they got twenty thousand dollars a year, the, the crowds are not going to stay away from the stadiums at Michigan and Texas and UCLA and all the other football factories because the players might be getting paid, or there might be some acknowledgement. Hey, you know what? We're not going to. We're going to give you like a twenty thousand dollars stipend, but you should have a little share of the sales when we, the NCAA, which they did, sold Johnny Manziel uniforms at the NCAA website. That is essentially the, the, the idea. What I don't, I don't know why that should be some sort of secret. It's like, who are you, who are you kidding? Nobody cares, and you're not fooling anybody. So that, that to me, is the essence of, of that problem. And, and I understand that for the weekend, there is something, uh, the coverage, and I believe it's uh, yeah. CBS, they're going to have a camera it is. on Johnny Football the entire game. Who yes. are they playing this weekend? Doesn't matter. They're playing, they're playing Johnny Manziel's <laughs> expectations. They're, they're, what can he do? Yeah. Well, this, you know, I would be in a bad position to sort of pound this because I think ESPN did this with, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 different athletes, or at least one, I don't know. But it's, it's not an uncommon practice to have just an ISO camera on one player. I think they did it with LeBron James a couple times in the NBA. Wow. So, you know. uh, well, anyway, I, I'm on Johnny Football's side. I mean, honestly, yeah, guys, you've you got to be. It's college pro football. So what, does that diminish it in some way? We think they're all amateurs and doing it for the grades? What did you think of uh, the president last night? I was watching sports. Is that right? You didn't yeah. see the president? Yeah, it's really nice. Well, now help me out here. <laughs> what, what happened? Because it looked like we were going to go in and yeah. kill him, which was, you know, I'd voted for killing him. Yeah. Uh, and then now we're going to put it on the back burner and we're, we're making a deal with our good, good, trustworthy, <laughs> longtime friend, Vladimir Putin. That's right. Pickpocket car thief weasel. Right. I think the term you were looking for was semi elected, semi dictator. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. 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 And, and it's all going to come together and work out. Now, we still reserve the right to go in and uh, take care of uh, Bashar al Assad yeah. with weapons. But what, nah, what, so, so what, is this a visionary strategy that uh, 40 years from now we'll think, oh my God, the man was a genius? Right. This is a box yourself into a corner strategy. I don't know that it was necessarily a visionary. The president said something. And again, I'm speaking just as a private citizen. I have no professional experience in this whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least we're trying to wipe that from people's memory. So I'll now go on about the president. So the, 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 what he did was he said there's this bright red line and if they use chemical weapons then we'll have to do something about it. Well, lo and behold, apparently they use chemical weapons and the president went to Congress to get approval to go into Syria, unlike previous presidents, and not just Bush, but dating back to Lyndon Johnson, where they just went, hey, push the button, let's go. Uh, he went to Congress and apparently he's not going to get the authority, the authority to do this. Now, there's many arguments about whether or not a president needs that congressional authorization to go to war. My understanding, he doesn't. But if you ask, and you don't, and they don't say yes, you can't turn around and go, thanks anyway, send the planes. You can't, I mean, you can't do that. And so the president has blocked himself into this little, this corner where he had to float something through the Secretary of State, which was Monday, John Kerry, who said, you know, uh, if they want to avoid bombing, they could just put these weapons under international uh, control in the next week which is the first sign that it's not going to be anything for a week. And then the Russians said, hey, that's a good idea. And then the Syrians said, we can talk about that. And that's what's going to happen. Yeah. So is, uh, yeah, yes or no, is this a, a good, better, more enlightened way to approach this problem or not? Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And I think we were, we were going to be lucky in this one. They'll get rid of the, at least the weapons. And at, at some point, the Assad government has to collapse of its own weight. Anything else? Uh, Derek Jeter, a disabled... Uh, Derek Jeter, uh, gone for the season, yeah. apparently. Never will play again with Mariano Rivera in a Yankee game. How and about you think he'll be back next season? Could be, but he tried to power through a very bad ankle. And, you know, being a success at a young age and healthy his whole career, he said, no, just because my ankle is, is screaming at me, I'm going to break soon, sure. is no reason to stop playing. And in fact, he did just broke it right there on the field eventually. Yeah. And, and uh, we'll be 40 soon, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, I hope he comes back. I do too. But and I hope you come back, and I hope when you come back, All you right. still have the same show. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank we'll you be right much. back with Keith Urban, ladies and gentlemen.